Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. I uh, appreciate you attending our weekly webinar here at SMB Nation. Uh, as always, a couple of announcements and some housekeeping up front, then we'll get to the good stuff. So first of all, totally appreciate your time, um, as always. And, and I, I always mean that so sincerely, but uh, it's just really starting to, to get busy out there. I mean, the latest jobless numbers, you know, the economy, again, pocket MBA moment, but the economy to date has added about 2.4 million jobs this year, and we've been clipping along at over 200,000 jobs a month. Well, that, that translates in the Main Street, and that means we're getting busy, and that means people are going to be buying, buying laptops, desktops, tablets, and and, and everything that uh, the IT spend looks like. So I realize an hour of your time is an hour of your time. I appreciate it. Um, we are headed into the holiday season, but I've got good news. We've got a packed uh, webinar schedule. So for example, Thanksgiving week, the webinar will be on Tuesday. So you'll receive an announcement about that. But we're all booked up through the end of the year for our weekly webinars. That's pretty exciting. And hopefully you'll you'll find a spare moment to join us for those. Uh, as always, use the chat feature. Um, use the chat feature for your questions. Uh, shout out to our sister site, o365nation.com. So that's really starting to gain momentum. And you're going to see a lot more activity on that after January 1st, but o365nation.com. And then also poke around SMB Nation and uh, o365nation for the seven-city tour information. And we're... we're significantly ahead of projections on enrollments for that seven NFL cities and uh, we made one small announcement and and like boom got 20 people signed up for uh, LA uh, like that so we're, we're, we're on to something which gets us to today's topic with Bill Hirsch from DNH and uh, so so Bill you out there how you doing are you are, are you in uh, Harrisburg Pennsylvania It's a long way out to Harrisburg. We'll have to let those sound, we'll have to let those packets travel out there. <laughs> so, Bill, uh, Bill, join us and join us as quickly as you can. Um, the idea today is that we're uh, exploring the Windows Server 2003 end of support, which is July 14, 2015. Uh, this is a one-hour lecture from uh, from Bill, who's a, a member of the community, a citizen, and then it has hooks into the 365 story. And it also has a couple of SBS love taps. So calling Bill, calling all the ships at sea, Bill. Can you hear me, Harry? I can hear you now. Like I said, those packets have to travel a long way from Seattle out to Harrisburg. I thought, I thought, I thought they moved a little faster than that. Jeez. <laughs> My God. So, so, Bill, let's jump into the good stuff. The, 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 these, these people don't take fools. They don't suffer fools lightly. So we've got to earn their trust and respect today. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm on it. I'm on it. Consider the mission handled. Okay, folks, um, I'm Bill Hirsch, Solutions Coordinator at DNH Distributing in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I, I want to thank you, first and foremost, for taking the time, just as, as Harry said, uh, for taking the time to join us here today. I realize how important time is and, and how, how uh, precious a commodity that can be for all of you running your own businesses. Thanks for taking 60 minutes out to, to devote to us here today. Um, the subject today is, is based on um, the Windows Server 2003 end of support. Um, I'm going to go over not only the end of support, but some options. Like, why, why is it a big thing, and then how do we overcome this? So we're going to talk about what, what points need to be sold to your customers, how, the, you know, how, how this is going to affect them, how big a, a deal it really is, and then how do we overcome it? What are our steps to go? So, Heather, I'm ready for my next slide, please. Okay, to start with, what's the issue? Um, I'm going to start off by saying that I don't typically read slides. Okay, I'm going to walk through this stuff. I'm going to assume that everybody here can read what I've got up here. But the big issue is is similar to what we experienced last April with the end of support for Windows XP and Office 2003, except it's 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 scaled much larger. Um, you can overcome you know moving off XP, moving off Office 2003 onto a new PC. At at, at worst, you're going to, you're going to lose a little bit of data that you had on your local drive. Moving off a server. That is a, a much bigger deal. And this affects every single Server 2003 product that, that Microsoft makes. So it's, it's standard enterprise data center. It's 2003 and 2003 R2. Don't think that, that the R2 machines get a break. Um, the uh, small business server 
is also affected, both flavors, both standard and premium. Um, I'm, I'm going into this assuming that, that you're all familiar with server migrations and, and some of the steps that it takes and, and the importance of a server in, in a customer's business and how critical a feature that is of their business. But to, to, to go down to the most basic level and take a look at it, server migrations are, are, not, are not the same. They are not as simplistic and easy as a desktop migration. You've got line of business applications that are, that are sitting on that server. You've got company data that in a lot of cases is, is federally mandated or state mandated and must be retained in one manner or another. Losing it is not an option. And then you've got the usability, the fact that, that this server is what helps our customers run their businesses day in, day out, every day. So huge changes and great big jumps in technology, while they might be great, and, and personally I'm a huge advocate, they need to be approached cautiously too because in some cases you go from that learning curve to a learning cliff. And we all know that a learning cliff is just really tough to overcome. The other big yeah, kicker here. That's a pretty good way to put it, Bill. Um, hey, and if you don't mind, what I would also add, uh, and if you don't mind me interrupting you as oh, usual. Oh, jump in, man. Feel free. Okay. Now, I love, by the way, that's pretty good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal that line. Um, but the, uh, <laughs> uh, this is also spot on with our community. Bill, I, 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 when, when I did that 44 City XP migration tool for our, uh, tour for our friends at Lenovo, <laughs> quite frankly, um, I, I, I didn't. I was underwhelmed by the excitement of our audience yep. about XP migrations. Bill, this is spot on. Please continue. Sure, thank you. Um, the, the other thing, and, and to, 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 to add on to what Harry just said, we, we were underwhelmed when we, when we approached April as well. Um, once we got to about mid-May, we started becoming overwhelmed as more and more XP users panicked and went, oh my God, I just called Microsoft to have an issue. They said, I'm screwed, now what do I do? Or I just figured it out, or any number of things that meant that the drop dead date was not a drop dead date for our business to happen. It was a drop dead date for our customer support. It's a very important date. We want to make things happen before that date, but don't think that July 15th, this is going to end for us. If anything, July 15th, this is going to kick it up several notches. But the other kicker here is that with, with XP, we had a lot of people going, you know, what do I do? Um, I, 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 I've got to make something happen, but I don't have time to do it now, or I don't have the money to do it now, or I can put this off just a little bit longer, right? And again, with the desktop, you can get away with that. With a server, you can't. And let, let me tackle a couple things here real quick. Um, the first reason you can't is because there are regulations Okay, there, there are federal, there are state mandates. You've got HIPAA, you've got high tech, you've got Sarbanes-Oxley, you've got any number of federal regulations that say, A, you need to take care of your data in thus and such a manner. B, all of it needs to be supported by manufacturers. So a lot of your software is not supported if the operating system underlying it is not supported. Even you could you could have you could have QuickBooks 2013. If it's sitting on Windows XP right now, QuickBooks is going to say, let us know when you move it to a Vista or a Windows 7 or a Windows 8 machine and we'll talk to you. But right now, you can't tell me that the problem you're having is the Windows problem. That's, that's, that's an issue with that one, that, that one system. When it's your server, when it's your line of business application, it's a much bigger deal and the penalties get correspondingly larger. It, 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 if, if a business chooses to say, you know, I'm going to approach this just as it is and I'll take my chances, that's fine if they do it with their eyes open. If they don't know about it until it's too late, that's a huge issue because these fines in a lot of cases start off at five figures and go up. That is, that is really not the place for your customers to be, especially if they're counting on you to make sure that they know what's going on. Um, the other thing, and this is the one that we're seeing is, is really, really huge for, for a lot of our customers. Many customers out there are taking credit cards at this point in time. They have a small retail operation of some sort, whether it's their services, whether it's products, whether it's a mix. but PCI DSS, the payment card industry, mandates that the operating systems underlying, for, for you to breach PC, PCI DSS compliance, all the operating systems must be, must be supported by a manufacturer. July 15th, that's going to be an issue. Now, I'll tell you that at this point in time, I, I have not personally seen that any uh, payment provider has said, if you're running a server 2003 machine, we're not, going to, we're not going to pay. We're not going to accept your charge. We're not going to pay. However, some have started making that noise, and we're several months out. The last thing you want to think of is your customer, the small business, taking credit cards, 
trying to run a customer's credit card for the money that helps run their business on July 15th and finding that they can't get that card to, to take. Not just one, not just some, all. That's a huge issue. And in a lot of cases that your customer is going to be, you know, kind of tempted to go, well, I'm not sure I need to worry about this. I'm not sure it's that big a deal. It is that big a deal. And it's a big enough deal that it, it, will, it will take money out of their pocket. And if they let it go long enough, it will, it will take money out of their pocket until they have no more money left. So if you think I'm, I'm trying to throw a little bit of scare to you, I am. It's that big a deal. Harry just pointed out to me this morning, the Department of Homeland Security has sent out a bulletin on the end of support for Windows Server 2003. It's that big a deal. Make sure your customers are aware of it. Um, right now, Microsoft, HP, Lenovo, Dell, Intel, um, all, all of the major PC and server manufacturers have pages dedicated to this. If you want collateral to, to let your customers know this is what's going on, it's out there. Heather, let's go on to the, to the next slide. Let's get past this part and how we're going to fix this. Okay, so what's hey, our one, solution? Bill, hey, Bill, one more cultural insight. Jump in there, sir. This is the, uh, the oracle and the keeper of the, uh, the culture, <laughs> at least in my own mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nice. nice. The, uh, <laughs> but, you know, guys, listen, I'm, I'm going to level with you. I was underwhelmed by your, uh, your, your, your body language on the 44 City XP tour. I got it. Um, I'm frustrated with your, uh, some of you, uh, we've come a long way, but some of your attitudes towards cloud and 365 and this and that and ramming it down my throat. I get it. Um, this is in your wheelhouse, okay? There is no, you are server side guys. <laughs> this is a server side matter at its core. There's no excuse. <laughs> So well said. On, Bill. I just well had to said. get that off my chest. <laughs> I'm right there with you. Okay, so right. the solution here, more than anything else, the solution comes down to one word. That one word is relationship, and that is the relationship between you and your customers. If right now the, the, the majority of your business or all of your business is predicated on break, fix, and waiting for the phone to ring, and your customers say, hey, this isn't working, I'm not real happy about it, get over here as soon as possible, make it fix, that's, that's not necessarily the model that's going to work for this, okay? maintaining a, a solid relationship with your customers on a regular basis so that they understand your value, that they call you when they're thinking about integrating something new into their system as opposed to calling you just when something's broken, that's the value we're looking for. And if you don't have that right now, then you want to start renewing those relationships with your customers right now. We know you have the customer files. We know that you know who your customers are. The question is, do your customers know who they are? And if they don't, it's time to make them you know, familiar again with, with us. It's time to make them familiar with the, the IT professionals that are making their business run and keeping their business afloat, okay? The, 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 we want to see that the, the two words that are most important about that first, first bullet are price and value. None of us want to go into this as, as the price guy because the price guy always, always loses. Somebody will always beat you. And if they don't, if you're the one that wins, you haven't won. The guy that goes in on value will make typically more money than you expected to. Okay, so these next few bullets I'm going to go down through in the uh, over over succeeding slides. But basically, what it lays out is your solution means need, you need you need to plan out now how you're going to touch your customer, what you're going to offer your customer, how you're going to discover what your customer has, and how to respond to them when they come back to you. So Heather, can we go on down to uh, slide four, please? Okay, the first step before you can do anything else is figure out what you can do for your customers. Now, I will tell you that that, that DNH uh, focuses on a lot of the same space that SMB Nation does. Um, Small Business Server has been our stock in trade for over a decade. We've, we're, we're very familiar with that product. Uh, we're very familiar with the popularity and the reasons for its popularity in our space. Um, that being said, small business server is dead. It's not coming back. A bullet was put soundly into its head. It's been buried. It's gone. Okay? So for those of us that are sitting there going, man, I wish I had small business server, we're going to be saying that when we start working for someone else because we didn't pivot. We didn't move with the market. Okay? Let's not put ourselves in that position. There's plenty that we can do 
that, that feels very small business serverish and that small business server has plenty prepared us for without having SPS itself, okay? So what can you offer the end user? You, can you do app migration? Can you do data migration? Do they know how secure they are or how unsecure they are? Insecure? Insecure, pardon me there. Where did I learn English? Um, in, in most cases, they don't. And if, if you follow up any of the trade rags, if you follow what any, any of the, the, uh, the Department of Homeland Security says, what any of the SBA says, right now, the single biggest um, demograph, business demographic uh, that's a, a, a malware target is small business, okay? 15, 20 users and below, they make a decent amount of money. Their security is typically subpar. And, and if, if you hit enough of them, you're making at least as much money as if you hit a big company and you don't get the same headaches. A lot of guys in, in Africa, a lot of guys in uh, Eastern Asia, a lot of guys in Eastern Europe are aware of this, and they're doing that. If your customer is not secure, you need to be the hero, the white knight that lets them know, hey, you're missing this. And you want to think about this for a second. If they're still running server 2003, and this was actually brought to me by one of, one of my, my uh, partners in crime here at work today, if, if your customer is still running Small Business Server 2003 or Server 2003, whichever, and it's, it's been running fine for them, you need to question what, what kind of age they have on the rest of their IT infrastructure. Are they running a six or seven or eight or nine-year-old server? How old, is, how, how old is their networking gear? How old is their, is their, their Internet connection? How, what kind of security, if any, are they, are they running you know, Norton 2003? Because if they are, that's an issue. I mean, it was an issue in 2003. It's a much bigger issue in 2014. But having them understand how, how important and how valuable their data is, their, 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 their corporate information is, is a big step towards them understanding the value that you bring to their table. You want to be able to tell them this very simply. You don't, you don't want to, you know, it doesn't need to be a book. It doesn't need to be a full paper. Here's what, here's what I can do for you. As, as Joe A number one bar, I can do this and this and this and this. And whatever you do, do not on any piece of, of marketing collateral you put out to your customers, put a price. Because as soon as, as soon as you've done that, you've opened the door for them to come back to you and say, A, will you do it for less? And B, what all will you do for this? And any of you that have ever seen Project Creep, where, where you, can you do this too and this too and this too and, and the numbers never add up, don't put yourself in that position. Then the final step when, when figuring out your offering is how do you want to get this message out? Uh, personally, I'm a huge advocate of, of uh, constant contact. If you're using Office 365 uh, internally right now and you're using CRM internally, you have ways of contacting your customers that way. Uh, for, for small business customers, an old-fashioned mailer can be a really, a really good thing. And the other thing to remember is, is this, this won't happen with one wave. You're not going to get all your business in one wave. You need to plan out multiple successive waves. And they don't have to be huge. You don't have to spend a ton of money to do this. Because I don't know about you guys, but I want to hold on to some of my money. But plan on messages that reinforce each other that go out across email, then direct mail, then email, then direct mail, or multiple emails. Put up a website. You know, if you have a website right now that, that you direct your customers to, make sure you throw a page up there that says this is something you need to be aware of and put that URL out there on any type of collateral you put out to your customer. Awareness for the next few months is going to be key, well, the next several months is going to be key to our success. And bear in mind, when you're talking to Harry and I, when you're talking to anybody that's, that's coming to you from a vendor point of view, our success is 100% dependent on your success. We're going to do everything we can to make things happen for you. Let me, yes, sir. What I would add is uh, I was recently schooled by longtime speaker and community member Todd Colbeck out of Miami. You've met Todd and I have. At, at, at different conferences, and his niche is LinkedIn, and he's got some really interesting approaches. And so he's doing a pilot program with some MSPs right now, um, and, and, and he actually got me motivated. I'm much more active on LinkedIn now, posting daily uh, real content. Not a not a ad in disguise up on the three six five <laughs> groups and um, but what he said with some MSPs and he's he's testing we're helping him he's testing it right now and he wants to roll it out as he's getting them to participate in uh, whatever that local LinkedIn group is for your community and every community has them so you know ranging out here from Bainbridge Island moms which you know may not be the best 
server-side upgrade uh, community. But, Bill, what I'm saying is every town has some kind of LinkedIn group, right, where business people congregate. And you, you go to those things, and there's anywhere from several hundred to several thousand people. And, guys, what I'm suggesting you do is uh, you can even post up existing articles just comment it out. You know, you go into a LinkedIn group for uh, for, for Denver, and, and you find sort of the Denver small business uh, group, several thousand people, and just three times a week, uh, not all on the same day, but you start posting either unique uh, blogs you've written or reprovision blogs where you comment out up front, you know, what you thought about the blog, and this is cool. And, Bill, if you played this game, very quickly you become what they call a top contributor, right? Mm. <laughs> and, <laughs> Not a bad place you know, to be. Yeah, yeah, and you have to, but you have to keep at it. I mean, it's the consistency of three, four times a week doing it, but it's really good marketing, and I've been doing it on 365. And, and Bill, I've told you in the industry, I recently have, have freed myself up to return to consulting, and, and I just landed a one-day gig in uh, San Diego uh, the other day from that behavior. Um, to help an MSP with 365 strategy. So I just wanted to add that to your email of the constant contact conversation that, 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 that LinkedIn, guys, you really need to revisit that. You really need to do it. Go ahead, Bill. That's awesome. Thank you, Harry. Yep. Okay, Heather, can I bother you to sneak down to our next slide, please? Okay, so after we decided what we're going to offer, we need to figure out who we're going to offer it to. And much like the Windows XP um, opportunity, this, this is, is not just limited to your, to your current customers. And I, I want to put that out there. One of the things that we ran into with XP was so many customers coming up and saying, but I've already, I've already got my, my customers off of XP, you know, so I don't need to worry about this. Well, my, my question to them was, do you have as many customers as you want? And I, I seldom got a yes, I'm, I'm, I'm quite full. And then I asked, do all of the customers that you have, you know, kind of kind of match the template of what you want a customer to be, or do you have some customers you'd rather not have anymore, and rather replace them with better customers? And I got yeses to that one. So this is a chance for you to go out there and find new business with with something real besides price or the latest greatest hardware that that most end users, you know, really don't keep track of. This is an opportunity for you to go to small businesses that that need your services and wake them up to, here's what we need to do. So uh, it's, it's a matter of creating a couple of different communications, one for customers that already know you, assuming that you've, you've renewed a bunch of these relationships, you've made yourself re-familiar to your existing customer base. Um, and then a second communication to those that don't know you, introducing who you are, what the issue is, and, and how, how you can make that issue go away for them, how you can fix it. Um, the next step, as, as you can see here, is having a system in place ahead of time to track those opportunities. I, I know a lot of guys that, that track those kind of opportunities in an Excel spreadsheet and with, with Outlook reminders. Personally, I am not such a fan of that, especially when you have tools that, that are, are free or cheap available to us. Um, if any of you are, are not currently uh, Microsoft Action Pack subscribers, you are missing one of the biggest values available to Avar in IT today. You want a chance to, to dig in and get your hands dirty and play with some, some heavy-duty software without having to worry about somebody to pay for it at the end? The, the Action Pack will do that for you. It will help you prepare to do more than you're currently doing. And more importantly, it will give you tools to run your own business on. You've got access to CRM. You've got access to, to server and Office 365. Um, right now, honestly, where, where I'm seeing a, a lot of opportunity for VARs to to, to add to their own sophistication is just getting themselves on Office 365 and CRM online. It's, it's inexpensive. It's, well, if, if you have the action pack, it's free. Um, it's simple, like done in an hour simple, really simple. Uh, if you have existing on-prem stuff that you want to migrate out, that's even more simple. Uh, shameless plug, if, if you want some help migrating from small business server to Office 365, we have um, videos up on how to do that at uh, dnh.com slash solutions lab. If you have questions about that, we can help with that. Not to mention that the community here with SMB Nation is full of people that can answer those questions. But you also have licenses for CRM online. And if you want a chance to really, really track your customer base and beat up 
every single lead until it has died or bought, CRM is a way to do it. And you can do it for free using the action pack. So think about that. But again, you need to have that plan in place before you go out chasing your customers because if you miss one, you're going to miss a bunch. Make sure you're taking the time to cover that. You've got a little bit of time. It might require staying late a couple nights, coming in early a couple mornings, but it's not going to require a whole lot more time, and the potential returns are huge. And then finally is a business assessment for all these customers. For your existing customers, do you know? Are you familiar enough? Are you on their premises enough to know what they're running in the way of hardware and software right now? 100%, top to bottom, side to side, across their network. If not, you want to look at a business assessment checklist. For any new customers, without exception, you want to look at a business assessment checklist. If you're not familiar with the BAC, um, we also have a webcast on that on, uh, on the DNH uh, Solutions Lab website. But this is, this is not something we came up with. The, the, the idea of a business assessment checklist has been around this particular channel for well over a decade from, from people that I know. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was another webcast on just this subject by uh, Dave Cyber just uh, yesterday or the day before. And I believe that's recorded. So there's, there's opportunity out there for you to find a checklist that you like and for you to get assistance in figuring out how to use it and how to approach your customers. But a business assessment checklist, in case you're unfamiliar, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's that's going to be one of your key plays. Um, Heather, let's go on to this to this next page here real quick. Okay. So the response and tracking, I think I just went over this pretty well, but it's it's very important that the the follow up, especially if you're using CRM, be followed every time. The nice thing about CRM is that it's, it's going to track every phone call uh, that it sets you allow it to. It's going to give you the opportunity to check every email, to track every IM if you tie that into the system. And that's what enables you to, to keep track of somebody changing their mind, somebody slipping a little bit or coming a little closer to making the deal. Think about that. Um, Heather, let's go on to slide seven, please. OK. I mentioned I was getting ahead of myself. Business assessment checklist is uh, one of two tools on here that is not provided free of charge by Microsoft. There are a number of business assessment checklists out there, but the, a business assessment is, is a two-fold process. And to, to understand the real value of it, you need to kind of step back a little bit from where you are and what you might be doing to, to run your business today and think about really what all you're doing from, from the outside. Um, it's one thing to know a customer's technology. In a business assessment checklist, half of that is a technical assessment, which is going in and reviewing every single piece of hardware from, from their, their modem to their new printer to their old printer to any piece of hardware or software that they're running in their network right now or as part of the technology that runs their business, even if it's not actually in their network. And knowing what it is, knowing how old it is, knowing how new it is, knowing what it does for their company, and that's a key point right there, knowing the value to the company, and, and being prepared to track, either either track where that thing is in its life cycle or to find somebody to partner with that can track it. If, if it's a, a piece of hardware or software that you don't mess with and you're not interested in messing with. The other side of the business assessment checklist is the business assessment, which is actually sitting down with the customer and finding out how do they regard technology. Is, is it something important to their business or not? Is it something that, that they find to be uh, necessary or something that they find to be a necessary evil and they only spend the dimes that they need to to keep things from falling apart at any given time. Um, quick hint, that last kind of customer is not necessarily the best one to follow up with because you're going to work getting every dime out of them and they're always going to be unhappy about everyone they spend with you. But what you're looking at doing here is, is moving from being a computer guy to being an IT consultant to being a business consultant and being able to tell your customers this is how technology can help you. This is, this is how some technology that I'm aware of, but you're not, Mr. Customer, could make your day this much easier because I didn't know that you did this, this particular facet of your business. I didn't know that this was a part of your business. But we have these technologies that can make this easier for you. Um, Bill, it, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, I might just uh, let me wrap a little context around this. As, as you know, a couple weeks ago on literally Halloween Day was the – 15th anniversary of SMB Nation, and as many of the listeners know, for many years I've talked about the book, The E-Myth Revisited, that Dana Epp out of Vancouver, BC, a 
security MVP from Microsoft gave me. And, and you know, we're an aging demographic. A lot. I looked over the names of some of the people uh, attending this uh, webinar today. And without, you know, shaming anyone, but we're an aging demographic. <laughs> and many of us have owned companies for 10 or 15 years. And the point is this, Bill, is that you can't turn the wrench faster with the, uh, the paradigm shift in the technology that is, is inevitably going to result from the uh, O3 server um, migration campaign. It's certainly going to result in more efficient technology. So you guys, you've got to make sure your house is in order in an emith way, that your, your, your staff is kind of running the, the company day to day, and then you can tap into all your accumulated business acumen to be a mini management consultant. And that's how you're going to add value in this whole equation and these lists that you're 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 suggesting bill that you know this is right out of Anderson and Deloitte consulting 101 that's that's what these management consultants do and they get paid good coin so please continue but you're spot on <laughs> thank you thank you um, the, 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 tech, the the technical assessment part of this is, is not all that difficult if you have the right tools um, two tools that we're going to recommend right up front are Microsoft's Assessment and Planning Toolkit and the App Compatibility Toolkit. They're both free of charge. If you want uh, links to them, I can get those for you. Um, you, can, you can email me at solutionslab at dnh.com, or you can email Harry and he'll get it to me, or he'll get it to get you the links himself. But one way or another, we can get you the links to these, and I cannot begin to tell you how robust and easy to use these, these toolkits are. Uh, the map toolkit, the assessment planning toolkit, is just insanely in-depth when it comes to figuring out, A, what software you're running, B, what hardware you're running, C, what you can do with that, especially with the hardware side, as far as being ready to upgrade to either newer on-prem stuff or to move to the cloud. And I'm really hoping that nobody just shut their ears as soon as I said cloud there, because if you're not thinking cloud for at least part of where we're going here, you're, you're, you're doing the wrong thing for your business. Okay, not just your customer's business, your business. There's opportunity there that doesn't involve taking money or business out of our pockets. Okay, the application compatibility toolkit is going to be the next necessary step after using the map toolkit. To, to use the map toolkit, by the way, it's a simple process. You go in with with the uh, the toolkit on a USB drive. You plug it in. You install it on on one machine anywhere in, in the network, and it will go out and search the entire network and come back and tell you what all is hanging out there. Uh, it's really easy to use. It doesn't take too terribly long. I've, I've used it internally on a 100-plus on a node network, and it took just under a half hour to do a full assessment. Um, but from there, it told us what, what hardware and what software was sitting there. From there, we could go to the application compatibility toolkit and go, okay, which of these are upgradable? Do they, do they have apps to upgrade to? If not, what am I going to switch to? What am I going to direct my customer towards? Um, and then they let us know the challenges we're going, to, we're going to run into there. So you've got two free tools there that are very easy to use. Um, but another best practice I'll throw to you that uh, we're hearing a lot of success with out in the channel, and that is leasing. Um, please tell me that your customer is going to come back and say, that's too expensive for me. Because I don't think I've run into the customer ever in 15 plus years of doing this that hasn't said that. It's too expensive, it's too expensive, I didn't want to spend that money. Quick note, nobody walks into this wanting to spend money. The key to it is showing how spending this money is going to turn into so much more money down the road. And the easiest way to do that is to turn this from one big upfront capital expenditure into multiple monthly operational expenses. Move it from cash outlay to budget item on a lease. And they have the opportunity to keep the hardware and software if they want. They have the opportunity to, to refresh it with newer stuff if they want. They, op they have the opportunity to give it back and get out of business, whatever they want to do. But there are options here. If you have questions about this, again, contact me at solutionslab at dnh.com. I can answer those questions for you, okay? Um, and then finally, you have, you have the technical tools. Once you've made the sale, as far as being able to deploy a, a, a large number of either servers or desktops, or if we're doing this right, both, uh, a way to tune those, those systems, both server and desktop, and a way to migrate your users so that to them this is almost imperceptible, and they don't go through that learning cliff we talked about earlier. Pardon me one quick second, folks. And Bill, while, Sorry. Uh, let, yeah, now let me insert there, um, folks. It's uh, we're about midpoint on the uh, the webinar, so be sure to use that 
the chat feature to ask your questions. And you are attending the SMB Nation weekly webinar, which we appreciate. And we'll uh, have uh, plenty of time to answer your questions. Go ahead, Bill. OK. Um, Heather, can we go to the next slide, please? And this should be pretty, pretty easy to look over. We just talked about the application compatibility. That is going to be your single biggest roadblock. That's going to be what you run into, especially on some small line of business application. You go to Joe Dry Cleaner that knows he needs a new server. Uh, Joe Freight Hauler that, that knows his server's dying, and but he's built his business around this line of business application that keeps track of all his customers and has all of his customer data for the past 300,000 years in it. And that ISV has not updated that. That ISV is not going to support anything newer than Server 2003 R2. And when you run into that, the first step is find a replacement application that, that the customer can use. And let me be clear here. One of the, one of the first things that we hear is, I, I'm just going to virtualize this. I'm going I'm to virtualize the server. It'll be fine. OK, you can virtualize it, which means you can move on to newer hardware. However, it's still a Server 2003. It's still unsupported. And still, as a virtual machine, if it pukes, Microsoft is still going to say, you know, we warned you. And that's what it comes down to. So this is not a case of how can I keep the server 2003 running for yet another decade. It's how do I move my customer to the newer, better, key, better technology. Okay? Um, you're also going to hear and see, and we're seeing this already, a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt from small software vendors that have this customer base that is standardized on their old app, and they haven't spent a lot of money updating it because they don't have the money to, uh, to, to spend to, to update it. They're not going to. They're not going to have the money. They're not going to update it. You need to find a way around that, and you need to be prepared to counter that. As, as a distributor, we are often in a position to help you counter that. If you need help, if you need guidance, if you need direction, bear in mind that we talk to hundreds of you and your peers every week, okay, all the time. So if you're running into something, chances is, ch chances is, my English is horrible today. My apologies. Chances are that we've talked to someone in the past couple of days or couple of weeks that have run into the same issue, and we've worked with them to find a way around it, too. Uh, this is not to say that we know everything. We, we are fortunate enough to deal with a lot of people in the channel, so we get a lot of feedback. We hear a lot of what's going on out there, and we're able to, in most cases, help each other off of that. Okay? Price sensitivity, we just talked about. It's, it's, it's not really a surprise. This is nothing new. If you've been doing this for more than three days, you've already run into it. Make sure you have your options in line before you talk to your customer. Be ready for that objection. Don't be surprised by it. And then finally, the fear of the unknown. Um, I'm willing to bet that 90% of your customers, no matter which of you I'm talking to right now, 90% of your customers are not ready to change. They do not come to you with this brand new thing they want unless it was some cool new toy that they saw at Best Buy or something that they just got to have and now can you make it work in my network. But in most cases, change is not a good thing to SMBs, not for, not for any space. So you need to be prepared to get past that too. It's, it's important enough for them to need to want to change in this instance, or they're going to be in serious trouble. Heather, let's talk about what directions we can go here, please. Can we go to the next slide, please? OK, folks. What makes you different from anybody else they're going to talk to out there? What's going to make you different is that you're going to give them choices. You're going to give them options and ways to go that A, are affordable, B, are easy for them to do, C, makes sense to them. And it's not going to be the same solution for everybody. So your, 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 three, your three options here in 2014 moving into 2015 are an on-premise migration, a hybrid migration, or a cloud-only migration. And depending on the size of the company and how advanced they are and how much they love technology, any of these will work. Okay? Let's wander down one more slide here, please, Heather. Step one is the on-premise migration. If you've been doing this for any length of time, you've done this in, in some manner, whether it's desktop to, to desktop or you've actually had the occasion to do server migrations in the past. It's a familiar process. In many cases, it's going to, feel, it's going to be familiar products, at least for the most part. Um, and for you, as, as the project manager, there's a clean start and there's a clean to end. Here's, here's what I'm going to start with. And when we're done, here's what it's going to look like. Um, on one hand, that's good. On one hand, that's bad. OK, I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, the cons to an on-prem migration are, number one, that, that, that uh, capital expenditure we talked about, that big chunk of money. It's, it, everything is new in most cases. So there's, there's going to be a chunk of change 
change unless you have some option laid out for them ahead of time. Um, point two, the, the technology is out of date probably before you have it in your hands because that's the world we live in. But the thing is, six months, 12 months, 18 months out, out the line, that technology is getting more severely out of date. Um, and, and the biggest con for us is that any of this is easily price shocked. Because until your end user is interested enough to get down into the speeds and feeds and understand the values that you and the hardware that, and software that you recommend bring to the table, they can look at somebody with a lower price. And, and remember, there's always somebody willing to be cheaper. There's always somebody worse. Heather, can we go down to slide 11, please? Okay, so if we're going to do an on-prem migration, we're going to need a replacement server. We're going to hopefully upgrade some clients because I will tell you what we're running into uh, even this early in the game is that there are a lot of Windows XP clients still in play with small business server 2003 emplacements. Uh, people tend not to upgrade just a piece of it at a time, okay? And that also being said, the other things to look at there are networking gear, power support and power protection gear. Um, any of their cabling. Do you know how many 10100 switches are going on out there today and how much productivity customers are losing because of it? It's, it's little stuff that adds up. Software needs, they're going to need a new server, new network operating system. And I will tell you right now that I highly recommend Server 2012 R2. Um, if you have not played with it, if you have not checked it out, if you're sitting there going, I don't want anything that looks like Windows 8 ever, you're missing an opportunity, especially when you look at how little you use the particular start menu in a server. Um, if you haven't checked out Server 2012 R2 and you subscribe to the Action Pack, find an old machine that doesn't have to be powerful, load it up, play with it, beat it up. Server Manager in 2012 R2 and 2012 or 2012 R2 is the biggest help, the best tool I've worked with in the server infrastructure in years. And especially when you're going into a small business with multiple servers, Server 2012 Server Manager allows you to manage all those servers from one place. It allows you to be more effective. It allows you to remote in and do things much easier. It allows you to be better at what you do and make more money at what you do. You're going to need replacement applications for their existing applications and upgraded applications for things like Office and that sort of thing. And you'll need the migration tools, which we had pointed out earlier. And then finally, under technical needs, you're going to need to understand what, what they're looking to get out of their technology and where they can go. Now that's for their sake. For your sake, you also want to have a really good understanding of where they want to go even if they don't understand how technology can get them there because that's how you're going to be able to make yourself more valuable to that customer. And you also need a clear understanding of what their technical starting point is, what they need to overcome to get there, and how the technology that you can sell them will fill those gaps. Okay, Heather, let's try slide 12, please. Okay, all in cloud. I'm going to ask all of you to please keep listening, whether you like the idea of cloud or not, because this is really important, okay? Um, the pros of cloud. Number one, it gives you the greatest flexibility. Um, it's always latest, greatest. The, the, whether it's Microsoft and Office 365 or CRM Online or Dynamics Online or, or uh, QuickBooks Online or any of the, the, the competitive vendors out there with cloud-based offerings, it's easier for them to roll out big upgrades across the board and so they're doing it at this point in time every quarter. Every three months there are new features in your cloud-based software. That's crazy. This is the kind of stuff that we, we used to wait for three years, four years, till we got a new, a new version of Office or something. Now it's available every three months. And the kicker here, and this is really important, is that if, if it's all in cloud, all of your network operating system and application maintenance is handled by the vendor. Your responsibility as the VAR in that case is to maintain, maintain connectivity, to maintain configuration, to make sure that, that, that the way the cloud-based application and operating system are set up is to your customer's needs, and um, that everything internally as far as the clients and the internal networking is working. But when it comes to, to the, the server maintenance, the application maintenance, if you're going all in cloud, this is 100% cloud, all of that is handled by the vendor. You want to talk about taking a load off of your back, especially getting rid of 3 a.m. phone calls. Um, the hardest part about this for most of our customers, to be quite honest with you, is that there's a change in how you and the vendor need to work together. Um, initially, with Office 365 especially, it, w it was not a good change because it, many of our VARs um, felt that they were, they were kind of taken out of the equation, and rightly so. 
that, I mean, that was legitimate. At this point in time, however, Microsoft has moved Office 365 and Intune and Azure to distribution, to the, the model where you can buy it and resell it at your price. So you manage the markup, you manage the pricing, your customer doesn't ever have to talk to the vendor. So it's back to you managing that relationship. So that change is less than it was. The training curve, if you're used to training your customers on a regular basis, now this won't be a big thing. If you're used to, to doing a rollout every four years for a customer and then walking away for a couple years and coming back just to fix things, this is going to be harder. But with, with all in cloud, there's going to be, as I said, upgrades every three months. They're not big upgrades. That's the nice part about doing it so frequently is they're, they're little incremental things. But they're the kind of things where you can continue to show your value to the customer by saying, hey, were you aware of this? What do you think of this? Check this out. Uh, and then finally, there's less control in the hands of the VAR as far as the, the NOS and application. You, can't, you can no longer go to the office and reboot the server. If something happens, that's out of your hands. At the same time, the frequency that that happens with, having watched this now for five years, there's, there's no greater frequency of that happening with the cloud than of it happening with on-prem with, with our smaller customers. Servers go down. Applications go down. Yes, sir. Yeah, Bill, what I would point out on this, and by the way, Bill, about uh, just under 15 minutes left. Um, okay. A couple questions queuing up. But uh, what, what, what I would add with the vendor relationships, so we've announced, and um, everybody on this call is going to hear a lot more about our NFL City Tour coming up and uh, starting in January for uh, the whole 365 motion. And what, what we're saying in this uh, realm is that vendors are, are an equal partner in the community. Um, you know, that it hasn't always been the, the way things have been viewed. I mean, if you think back to the old-fashioned user groups, golly, Bill, I'll tell you, the, those guys, they, they thought the, vid, the vendor was the devil and evil. Oh, yeah. And it's, <laughs> we still see that. We still see that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's just changed, guys. So I just wanted to reinforce your point. But please continue. Thank you. Okay, uh, Heather, let's go down to, the, to uh, slide number 13, please, and let's figure out what we need for our all-in cloud needs. Now, bear in mind, folks, when I say all-in, what I'm talking about is moving your customer from an on-based, on, from, from, pardon me, from a land-based on-premise network entirely to the cloud. You're moving their server to the cloud. You're moving all their apps to the cloud. They're doing everything in the cloud except for their local computing, okay? Um, in which case, you need to look at networking choices. The hardware needs for an all-in cloud comes down to making sure that their internet never goes down, period, that they're secure, period. Not mostly secure, not kind of secure. You, you can't let anything get in there because if it can get, in, if it can get into them, uh, it can sit there and wait for them to, to pull data from the cloud. So even if your cloud's secure, it's going to result in, in a, a, a data hack to their data alone via that client. So security, the hardware needs with all in cloud, it needs to be a, a real focus. Um, Software needs is going to be clients, the applications. Bear in mind, folks, a lot of people are unfamiliar with this, but Office 365 still includes on-premise, on you know, locally loaded Office. You know, you're not giving up Office as you know it. So that will still be a part of what you do. Um, and then whatever endpoint security you choose to use. Um, and then finally, looking at, at which clients are going, to, are going to be able to use this the most, we find that, that smaller organizations, whether it's a, a, a charity, whether it's a church, because we're finding a lot of that, surprisingly. Um, advertising organizations, we're seeing organizations with higher technical needs and, and greater geographical spread, greater geographical disparity are great for cloud because they, they see the most value out of the collaboration they get and they see the greatest value of being able to work wherever they are, whether they're on client site, whether they're at home, whether they're in the office, if this office exists. The, the flexibility that they get here is, is where we see this happening. So again, bear in mind, all of these are options for your customers. Not all of them are options for all of your customers, okay? Heather, let's try this last, this, this, this last option, which is the next slide, 14, please. Hybrid cloud. Folks, when it comes right down to it, this is where we see the channel going, okay? The only times we see th that, that a customer is really unsuited for um, on-prem or is unsuited for the cloud at all is if they physically cannot get connectivity that, that will stand up to what they need, okay? If they're only capable of getting a 1.5 meg DSL line, their, their, their cloud experience is probably going to be less than optimal. It's, it's not going to be terrible. They're still going to be able to use it, but it's not going to be perfect. 
Whereas if they're getting if they're getting you know 25 down or 50 down via Comcast business or Time Warner business or something like that, they, they, this is an option for them. You know, the idea of, of using some cloud is an option for them. But the, the idea of a hybrid cloud comes into place because this gives you the option what goes to the cloud and what stays here. So I've got some stuff I'm not comfortable putting on anybody else's computers. That's fine. But you have some stuff that can go elsewhere. For any of you that are out there right now supporting an exchange server, for an organization that, that is, is less than 100 people, my, my first question to you would be why? Because you can, you can put that in, in Microsoft's basket and say, make sure my email stays up. It's going to be a whole lot cheaper for you. It's going to be a whole lot cheaper for your customer. There are going to be fewer headaches for you. And if you do it via Office 365, you're going to be able to get them SharePoint and Link, too, which they're not going to be able to get for less than 10 grand on-prem. The, the, the value that comes with Office 365, especially in our space, and bearing in mind we're talking just about small business here at this point, but the, the, the opportunity that Office 365 brings to us, if, you, if you're not at least investigating it, you're really not doing yourself any favors, okay? Um, we're seeing a lot of small organizations, medical organizations, legal organizations that are choosing to keep some stuff on-prem, choosing to put some up in the cloud. Bear in mind that at least in Microsoft's case at this point in time, they, they've got encryption across the board. They've, they've, got, they've got greater security, I guarantee you, than, than you have for any of your end users. And that's not saying you're not doing your job. That's saying that at this point in time, the, the, the military is saying, okay, we trust you. Not, not just the government, because we know that can be shaky, but the military is saying, okay, we trust you to keep our data secure. So for those that are saying HIPAA or high tech or Sarbanes-Oxley, no longer an issue. Probably safer in the cloud than on the ground. But again, the cons here are learning curve for you, and you need to stay more on top of new technology. So if you're used to being a break fix guy, there are going to be some changes in, in, in how you do your business, OK? Heather, let's get on to slide 15, please. So the kicker here with hybrid cloud is needing to upgrade some servers. But the question is, are you upgrading to a newer, more powerful server, or just a newer server? If all it's going to be doing is Active Directory for you and their applications are in the cloud, do you need to, do you need some, some big, huge animal server, or are you doing just fine the way you are? Um, but again, looking at the cloud needs, as soon as you involve cloud, networking and network security is, is where you need to focus on. Um, the, the, the biggest point for you to remember when you're talking about hybrid cloud is, is my last point on this slide, which is that the, the uh, transition between on-prem and cloud for your customer needs to be just seamless. It needs to be clean. If they're going from an, an on-prem application and they're doing copy-paste into a cloud application, it needs to be just that easy. They don't. They need to not see it as being in two different places. Okay. They they need to look at it and go. I didn't know that that wasn't here. I didn't know that wasn't local to me. Okay. So. Looking at our cloud options, we are running out of time here, so I'm going to move along a little bit. Heather, can we try slide 16, please? Okay, cloud options. And these, these are, you know, where can you get started? Because if you're not comfortable with everything, that's fine. We get that. Not everybody wants to jump in head first. Sometimes sticking your foot in the cold water is, is the smarter move here. So you can get into it easily. Windows Server right now has, has built-in backup and recovery that ties directly to Azure. It's literally click, 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 and you're in. Okay? You have to set up your Azure account ahead of time, but it's it's affordable and it's easy. So that's an opportunity for you. Office 365, we can walk you through that and, and getting set up on that literally in a half hour. And it, it allows your customer to get a lot of Office, excuse me, especially including the Office they're used to for a lot less money than they're used to spending. Um, you're also finding that a lot of security is, is moving to the cloud as well. If you're looking for something more sophisticated, you've got customers that, that can't go down ever. You can, at this point in time, do failover, uh, failover networks, with, complete with Active Directory and everything in Azure. You can build your applications in Azure and quickly. And you can manage your customers' devices, everything, including phones, everybody's phones, iOS, Android, everything, via Intune through the cloud. So there's opportunity there. Um, I'm not going to get too much into, into the Azure opportunity. But if you have questions about Azure, I'm going to urge you to give us a call here at DNH. Um, I think I have my phone number up there. If not, just email us at solutionslab at dnh.com, and we'll get in touch with you. But we can answer your Azure questions. We can help you see what, what new opportunities are out there. Hey, and Bill, just uh, 
uh, folks, uh, shout out. Um, we haven't really announced it yet, but we have Azure Nation May 1st through 3rd at Microsoft Redmond. So early May, Azure Nation. Bill, That's let's continue. awesome. Thank you, sir. Yep. yep. Um, OK, slide 17, please, Heather. OK, folks, to, to kind of wrap this up a little bit, when you're looking at this, don't offer them a piece. Don't talk to them about a part, because you and I both know that technology works best when all the pieces are clicking together. And when you upgrade one piece, it can help to upgrade others around it. So don't just go in for the server, because if they're still working on Vista machines that are running a P3, you're just not doing them any favors. Do the full assessment. Talk to them about the whole big picture and put it all together into, into a payment. Make it easy for them. Make it affordable to them. Remember, this is their business. They don't think of it that way because they're not in the computer business, but computers make their business run and can make their business run better. And there's nobody to better tell that story to them than you. Okay. Um, inclusion on, with the cloud means focus on the endpoint. Understanding your security needs, understanding how to approach your security needs, and um, beyond that, understanding that, that the learning curve that you're going to have to be on as of our in, in today's world, if you're going to survive in this, means knowing what's out there and staying on top of it more than ever. So slide 18, if I may, please, Heather. How can DNH help? This comes down to where, where we come into play. Um, we can help in marketing. We have uh, templates, uh, what we call partner services templates, that allow you to semi-create your own let's, let's go get them kind of thing. We also have links to multiple manufacturers' uh, marketing collateral. So we can give you the pieces to put together your own marketing collateral. In addition, we do ad hoc advertising. So we can give you a quote on, okay, we can put together this into a template for you and help you get the list to, to put out to this many people. That's, that's on an as-needed basis, so it's a, a, a kind of quote type of business, but we can do that for you. We can get you financing assistance. We can help your customers with leasing. We can make sure that, that we can spend their money without touching your credit line because the biggest issue we ran into with the XP thing was customers saying, I've got this great opportunity. My credit line doesn't support it. And if I do do it and I find some way to make this happen, I won't be able to do anything else for 30 days. We can help you get past that. There are always, always solutions for that. We can also help with component recommendations. In a lot of cases, we recommend, in most cases, we recommend to our customers that they keep things as vendor-centric as possible and focus on one or two vendors instead of trying to do a little bit from everybody. So if you've got an HP network, make it an HP network, and that way you've got one throat to choke when there's a problem. It's really hard for HP tech support to point at a Lenovo server if it's an HP server, you know what I mean? Um, and finally, we, do, we have the technical how-to. We have uh, vendor best practices up on uh, dnh.com slash solutions lab. We have uh, the technical migrations, complete with screenshots and walkthroughs. This is what you need to do. This is where you go. That can take you to either on-prem from small business server to on-prem exchange or to Office 365. So we've got, we've got the whole migration thing out there. We've got the Azure backup thing out there recorded on video. Here's how you do this. We've got the steps laid out for you. So no matter what you're doing, we're here to help, whether it's technically with sales assistance or with marketing, DNH can help. Contact your DNH sales rep, and, and we're here, to, we're here to, to walk you through whatever we can. All right, Bill, ready for some quick questions? We got a few. Hit me. Um, yeah, and I, I, I'll take a stab at a couple of them. Uh, let's see. Because I'm seeing, I'm seeing nothing. I'm sorry if it's in the chat. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's over on my window. So help okay. I'm being held prisoner in a Chinese fortune cookie factory. Okay, we'll send help now. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Bill. Tired nice. joke. Tired. It's all good. Tired it's all joke. Good. All good. All right. Uh, can you have Bill send a general download for all the toolkits? Yes, he can. We have a thank you email going out tomorrow, Bill, to the attendees. Maybe if you could pop that over to Heather. I will have um, links to you, no problem. The links? Uh, where can I get good support for migration? Um, I'll, I'll take a stab at it because it ties into the second one. Can you recommend migration tools? So. Um, guys, I'm most familiar with uh, Skykick and BitTitan, and um, those are pretty popular migration tools in our space. Dell has a enterprise tool called Case, K-A-C-E, that's uh, a little bit beyond. And then the big system integrators like CompuCom and, and MicroLAN and the I'll call the big boys who do 5,000 seats and above, they have their own tools. So recommend Skykick and uh, BitTitan. Um, I'm happy to uh, take 
is that specific question offline. If you're looking for talent to help you with the migration, um, drop me a note at harryb at smbnation.com, and I, I, I can offer some other suggestions. One of those two migration tools that I've just mentioned, uh, within the next month, we'll have a, uh, an announcement regarding talent um, that they will have available to help their partners with migration help. But I can't really tell you that much more right now. Bill, do you, do, do you have any insights? So they're asking for migration assistance and migration tools. With migration tools, I'd go the same direction you did, except I would also point out the, 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 uh, some of the migration tools that Microsoft makes available, and they've made available very quietly but for free for years. Those are, those are some of the links that I will send along to, uh, to Jenny and Heather tomorrow. So we'll, we'll have those go out to the follow-up email to your to, to the partners. Okay, here today. and and Bill, just to clarify, DNH, you're you're not a consulting firm or a system integrator, so you don't dispatch talent out to help your partners in the field do work side by side. That's typically not what a distributor does. Is that right? That is that is correct. We, we, what okay. we can do is, is we can we can point out, okay, so if if you're in a certain area, and we know somebody else is in your area that has done some of this. Uh, you know, sometimes anecdotally we can help that way, but typically there's there's not really a way that we can assist with with finding the right talent. That's right, and that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at. Is I'm happy to help as I'm able. Um, next question. In fact, it's our last question, so that's timely since we're a couple minutes over, folks. The question is, I'll, I'll answer it first, and then let Bill answer it. it. Says internet outages are real how to deal with the loss of connectivity or even the outage by the host site. So I, I, I have a very simple, this is a common question, I have a very simple answer, and it's go fishing. And the, <laughs> the, 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 the point is, is, you know, I'm on an island, the power goes out, here go, the internet goes out, what are you going to do? Go fishing. Get out your rod and go fishing. Um, and and I'm, I am being a little facetious, but Bill, we went through exactly this conversation a decade ago when the PBX, the old school PBX telecom guys, hated cloud-based VoIP, hated VoIP. And that was their whole point was, what are you going to do when the power goes out? What are you going to do when the internet goes out? And after you years of debating, I just said, I said, go fishing, guys. <laughs> Bill, do you want to tackle that? That's our last question. <laughs> but it, to, 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 me, to me, it's a really simple question because, yes, you're right, Internet outages are real, and there's no denying that. At the same time, an Internet outage is just as likely to hit your customer close to home as, as it's to hit, to hit Microsoft uh, you know, close to their data center. And so not being able to hit the Internet with an Exchange server on-premise is just as downtime and, and causes just as many issues. As, as you know, not being able to, to hit your exchange in, in the cloud. Remember, Office 365 isn't all of a sudden everything I do is in the cloud. You still have all your local productivity to your local machines. You still have your local network. The, the, the Internet connectivity is, is no bigger an issue. It's just at a, at a different end of, of the relationship. Yep. Yep, exactly. Um, so, folks, we're going to wrap it up. We're a couple minutes over. So this was the, the, the webinar today on the Windows uh, Server 2003 migration opportunity. You'll receive uh, a thank you note with the links from Heather tomorrow. Bill, thanks for, and by the way, Bill, my compliments. You know, we strive to make sure we're providing academic content on these webinars, and I would say we met that goal that people are leaving with real value, hopefully knowing something they didn't know beforehand. And uh, let's not let too much time pass, Bill, before we do it again. Thank I'm you a fan, Harry. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. Okay. Back to work, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye now.